In January 1924, the world learnt that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, had died. Around his coffin stood the members of his government, old Bolsheviks, who with him had carried out the communist revolution in Russia. Which of them was to take his place? It was to be this man, the head of the Communist Party Secretariat. At this time, the outside world knew almost nothing of him. His real name was Joseph Dugajvili, but he chose to be known as Stalin, Man of Steel. Events were to prove that name well chosen. This is the story of how this man turned Russia into a world power with himself supreme at its head. Stalin was looked on as dull and secretive and had not played a very prominent part in the revolution. He realised that true power lay within the Communist Party organisation. So when the post of party secretary was offered to him, after several others had turned it down because it seemed so dull, Stalin saw the chance it would give him to be at the centre of affairs. He could also appoint like-minded party officials throughout the Soviet Union. Lenin had not favoured Stalin as his successor. He's too rude, too arrogant, he said. Many thought the man to lead the state was Trotsky, the organiser of the November Revolution and creator of the Red Army. He'd shown his ruthlessness in 1921. The sailors at Kronstadt naval base had mutinied in protest against the Communist Party's harsh rule. Trotsky's reaction had been swift. He'd ordered troops across the ice and the revolt was crushed. In the Kremlin in Moscow, the disagreement between Stalin and Trotsky over the future of Soviet communism went on. Trotsky wanted the party to stir up revolution in countries threatening the Soviet Union. He looked forward to the steady and inevitable march of communist ideas throughout the world. But Stalin argued the way to protect the revolution was to make the Soviet Union herself strong. And his views prevailed. Trotsky was arrogant and had never really been liked within the party. In 1926 he was dismissed from the Politburo and two years later he and his wife were sent into exile. He sought sanctuary in a number of countries including France, Norway and Mexico where he continued to denounce Stalin until his murder in 1940. By 1929, Stalin had promoted people loyal to him in the Politburo and was virtual dictator. Now he intended to force through his plans to modernise Russia without opposition. At this time, private trading and ownership of small businesses was still allowed under Lenin's new economic policy, which had been introduced back in 1921 but Stalin wanted complete government control over all production. The answer was to be the five-year plans, and Lenin's new economic policy was abandoned. In government offices, production targets over a five-year period were laid down for every kind of product by an army of planners. Local committees then worked out ways of meeting these targets. The new state had little money to pay for machinery, but there was no lack of people. So the Soviet Union became, in effect, a vast labour camp. The idea was to change the industrial face of the Soviet Union in as short a time as possible. Tons of concrete had to be produced for the dams needed to control great rivers and create electric power. Timber from the Soviet forests was needed for the thousands of kilometres of new railway track ordered under the first five-year plan. Railways had to be built to open up the Soviet Union and supply the raw materials for the new industrial centres like Magnitogorsk being built deep in central Russia.
Many Russians, inspired by the vision of a new society, worked hard to meet production schedules. But Stalin's demands meant that slave labor was increasingly used. The canal, which joined the White Sea to the Baltic, had been built, as Stalin very well knew, by thousands of prisoners from the northern concentration camps. The modern Soviet state being created by Stalin needed a healthy and educated workforce. There was no place for the illiterate. Workers and peasants who could read and write and count would be of more use to the new industrial society. While the parents were being taught to read and write, their children were being trained in the new and expanding schools, universities and polytechnics. Research in science and technology was closely allied to the needs of the five-year plan. New hospitals and clinics were opened, more doctors trained, many of them women. The second five-year plan ran from 1933 to 1937. It called for more steel, more engineering, more electric power. Within the Soviet Union, there was no shortage of work, but this was the very period when America and much of Europe, including our own country, was suffering the effects of depression and unemployment. So the Soviet Union was catching up with the Western world rapidly. But this was not enough for the Soviet Union's leaders. They demanded even more effort from the workers. This coal miner, Stakhanov, did the work of 16 men in one shift. Everyone was told to work like the hero Stakhanov. If you did, you were rewarded. But slackers were held up to ridicule and punished. But there were failures, though they'd not, of course, be shown on official film like this. Not all workers were like Stakhanov, and many factories failed to reach their production targets. But in spite of this, Soviet industry kept going, and in the 1930s, the new factories began making some of the machinery needed for Stalin's other revolution, the revolution in farming. Agriculture was simple and primitive. Though the peasants now owned their land, they still farmed in the way they'd done for hundreds of years. Yet food production was vital. The grain was needed for export to pay for machinery from abroad and for bread feed the industrial workers in the cities. Peasants already had production targets. Often these were for much more than they could ever grow and so officials came to inspect their crops and confiscated their harvest. More grain had to be produced. So a new system was introduced, collectivization. In 1929, communist leaders began forcing the peasants to join collective farms, where they'd have to share the work and make best use of the new machines that were coming. Now there was to be mass production in farming, just as in industry. Many peasants hated the idea, especially the kulak, or richer peasant, who now stood to lose everything. Fierce resistance broke out all over the Soviet Union. Rather than accept collectivization, peasants burnt their homes, destroyed their crops, killed their cattle. And millions of peasants were rounded up and driven off the land. The effect on farm production was disastrous. In 1930, the Soviet Union had produced a record 85 million tons of grain. But by 1934, during the first years of collectivization, figures fell to 69 million tons, and there was famine. But Stalin was determined that the peasants should accept collectivization. The alternative was starvation and death. However, life in the towns and cities did improve for some. 
Official propaganda films were made to show workers how they could expect to live if they were loyal, hard-working citizens of the Soviet Union. But few had the chance to live in modern flats like this, with running water and central heating, or eat as well in such comfortable surroundings. In reality, Lamarism was very different. Constant shortages of food and other goods meant hours of queuing at shops. The cities were overcrowded, drab and comfortless. Stalin's planners produced many ideas for dream cities of the future. But they remained a dream except for some public buildings in Moscow and Stalin's showpiece, the Moscow Underground. Each station was lavishly decorated in a different style. And for the first time, workers could use a fast and cheap service. But the real achievement of these years was the success of industry during the five-year plans. In the ten years up to 1937, at the end of these first two plans, the figures for industrial output were going up dramatically. For example, by 1937, oil production had nearly trebled in those ten years. Coal production had increased four times. And over four times as much steel was also being produced. And what of Stalin during these years? At party rallies, the applause appeared to confirm him as the unquestioned leader of the new Russia. But his ruthlessness had made him enemies, and he became convinced that they were plotting to get rid of him. One of the most popular party leaders below Stalin was Kirov, an old Bolshevik and now party boss in Leningrad. In December 1934, Kirov was murdered. Some believe that Stalin deliberately ordered the killing himself, but he said it was a terrorist attempt to overthrow the state. His secret police began their work. They came at night to the homes of unsuspecting people, party officials, scientists, leaders of industry, army officers. Many were taken away and never seen again. Though the daughter of one of them was only eight at the time of her father's arrest, she still remembers every detail. I remember very well the time my father was taken away. I woke up in the middle of the night because both rooms seemed to be crowded with men. My father was sitting quietly in the corner. They took him away at seven o'clock. It was still dark. He kissed me goodbye and I never saw my father again. Later in the day, my mother sent me out to play. And I remember very clearly sitting in a little park near the house by a frozen pond when my little friend, Annushka, the daughter of the concierge, came out of the house and she had a huge piece of bread with jam on it. And she said quietly, do you want some of it? And she never said a word about my father, although she knew. The tragedy of it is that my story is not an exceptional one, because by and by, I discovered that most children in my class had the same experience, that their fathers were taken away, and they never saw them again. And they were ordinary, innocent people. Whether they were innocent or not, the hundreds of thousands of victims of Stalin's purges were likely to suffer the same fate. Old Bolsheviks, friends of Lenin, leaders of the revolution, were forced to appear at show trials, always accused of crimes they couldn't possibly have committed, against the party, against the workers, against the state. Yet, incredibly, they confessed, even apologized for these crimes, and awaited the sentence of the court. Punishment was inevitable and details broadcast to the world by Moscow Radio. 
Hello, you are listening to Radio Centre Moscow, broadcasting on 25 metres, radio station RNT. The Trotsky fascist criminals who have made an attempt against the property of the Soviet state and against the most precious thing of all, against the lives of our workers, have deserved their merciless punishment. The sentence of the court was received by toilers of our country with grave satisfaction. This is the sentence of our great country. Death to the enemies of the people. We have the great Stalin, our banner, our glory and our leader. We have the Lenin-Stalin party, the live creative force of our people. We have the Stalin Soviet government, the mightiest government in the world. Now Stalin was secure. Now all the celebrations were in his honor. He demanded applause and love, and few were brave enough to deny him. The cult of Stalin's personality had begun. Everybody bought the picture of the genius of the new age, the wisest man of the epoch as Pravda, the official communist newspaper called him. And in the new history books and paintings about the revolution, Stalin was always shown at Lenin's side. Even though he'd been far less prominent, the facts had to be changed to suit the present. Now he was always shown as the center of attraction. In 1937, as Stalin walked from the Kremlin to review his troops in Red Square, it appeared that his position as supreme leader and dictator of the Soviet Union was now absolutely secure. It seemed that the Red Army would now give him its undivided loyalty after the purging of nearly half its senior officers. The modernization of Russia had been accomplished at enormous cost in lives and suffering. Millions had died to make Stalin's Soviet Union a world power. The achievements of Soviet industry during the five-year plans had included the mass production of arms and equipment for Europe's largest army. Was the Soviet Union strong enough? Had modernization gone far enough to withstand the growing threat of Nazi Germany from the West and of Japan from the East? <laughs> 